<laughs> hey everybody, <laughs> thank you for joining today's webinar. I'm Josh Jones and today's topic is tackling high application volumes, strategies for positive candidate experiences in tech. Today we are joined by an incredible lineup of leaders. We've got Lachez Salaj, David Marr, Jackie Cunningham, and Alex Rojas. Please notice the chat feature located at the right hand side of your screen. This is a great place to engage with content, with speakers, with each other. But if you'd like to submit a question for today's panel, please use the Q&A tab. And I can't stress this enough, ask questions. We want this to be an interactive experience for everyone. Today's webinar is being recorded and you'll get a recording of today's presentation within 24 hours of the webinar ending. More often than not, we can get those rec recordings out the same day. Uh, before we get started, I would like to extend a special thank you to our good friends over at CoderPad for making today's webinar possible. CoderPad enables talent acquisition practitioners and hiring managers to screen and interview software engineers with realistic coding assessments and live pair programming interviews. Their engaging assessments and intuitive coding environment create a superior candidate experience that helps keep developers engaged while at the same time ensuring you're able to evaluate candidates based on their true skills and hire only the best fit talent. Today's webinar is being moderated by the wonderful, the amazing Lissage Shalaz. Lissage, I'm going to hand everything over to you. Uh, I'll be watching from the audience. So if you need anything at all, just talk. Oh, thank you so much, Joshua. Yay. So fantastic. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Lachez Solage. Once again, a little bit about me. I am the co-host of your Corporate IQ podcast, as well as a talent acquisition and development consultant. I've been in talent acquisition for 13 years, so the time is flying by. I can't believe it. Um, former executive recruiter and DEI sourcer for Marriott International, as everyone calls it, Marriott. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also a former uh, senior recruiter for Volvo as well, just to name a few companies. Um, my expertise includes full cycle recruitment, um, DEI, talent sourcing, and programs. And then I'm based out of Washington, D.C. With that, I'll toss it over to Alex. Okay. Hello, I'm Alex Rojas. I'm based in Orlando, Florida, but I'm a Washington, D.C. native. I actually got out of the DC market about 20 years ago, so now I'm a Floridian. But uh, I've been in talent acquisition now for almost three decades. So this is an interesting topic because I can remember a time, right? I'm going to date myself here, where resumes used to be faxed in, and so now we're dealing with an applicant overflow, you know, in the tens of thousands. So, but I, I have everything from an agency recruiting background, uh, working as a contractor, a consultant. I've had a couple of startups. Uh, I've been an executive program manager, and I'm really a talent advisor. I work with small to large size enterprise type of companies, and I've worked with Microsofts and IBMs, uh, Under Armors, um, Lidos, and so uh, wealth management all across all types of different sectors as well. So I'm excited to be here and con to continue the conversation. Yes, David? Hello, um, I'm uh, David Marr, based in the greater Chicago area. Uh, I've been in talent acquisition for 21 years. Um, have a, come from a background in executive search. Uh, I've done agency, corporate, and contract recruiting slash consulting. Currently uh, working for Coal Fire Systems as a principal sourcer. And my experience extends uh, both full cycle recruiting, sourcing, uh, diversity, uh, being a brand ambassador, um, and I work a lot on uh, senior level individual contributor roles through uh, executive positions. Yes, Jackie. Hi, everyone. I'm Jackie. I lead tech campus recruiting here at Datadog. I've been here six years now, um, which feels almost like dog years um, because of the last six years as a recruiter in tech. Before that was at Ernst & Young, working at higher volume, larger scale. Uh, so yeah, the responses and information you'll hear from me today are really from the perspective of campus hiring, looking at interns and new grads in particular for our engineering org. Awesome, awesome. I'm super excited to be here with my ERE community. 
Yay. And um, also to have this really important conversation. I think this is an important topic, so I'm really excited to kind of dive into that. But before we do that, before we dive in, I wanted to share some market data from Sense and Candy ben uh, benchmark research. Just for context, I usually like to do that. So according to their report, we're still in a volatile candidate market. I think we're all feeling that consisting of historically low unemployment, uh, mounting talent shortages at the same time in some professions, lower retention rates. Um, one of the things that they surfaced was the top sourcing channel for connecting with candidates was employee, employee referrals, which I thought was interesting. Uh, and in this environment, top employers are leveraging recruiting technology, which often includes AI functionality. I think we all are experiencing that as well. Um, I wanted to actually add in layoffs. I don't think we can you know, move forward without surfacing that as well. So I want to add that to, to that. Uh, what I find really fascinating in this moment is not only just the volatility in this market, but also the what I would call contradictory nature of the market as well. There's conflicting things that are happening at the same time. It's really fascinating. So with that, let's dive in. You guys ready? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, so in this section of questions, I want to understand your applicant volumes and how it compares to your typical volume and also understand how you're tackling it. So that's what this section of questions will be about. So the first question for the panel is, what are your current applicant volumes and what's typical for you? And we're gonna start with David. So in my current role, I'm um, on the sourcing side. So I am not tasked with, focused on, with uh, going through the volume of applicants currently. Um, so I'm gonna speak to uh, past experiences, but um, from what I've been told, I, I guess I'll share what my co colleagues have shared with me. Um, they have thousands of applicants for roles um, within a matter of days. So, mm. and that's not normal. I would say it's usually hundreds versus thousands. Wow. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, what about you, Jackie? Again, I, we understand that the context is campus recruiting, which is like really great perspective. What are you looking at in terms of volumes? Yeah, similarly, that that story definitely sounds right for what we're seeing. We're seeing um, thousands very quickly when jobs go live. Um, we're in the lull right now, so campus recruiting will really kick off in September, and that's when we'll see sort of for our season what it looks like for volume-wise this year. Um, but tens of thousands of applicants and for us looking at all of those in a very short amount of time as well. So being able to really go through all of that in a time sensitive way is really important. Wow. Okay. Perfect. And is that typical for you? So I understand that your business is probably more cyclical and that's, that's pretty customary for you, but are you seeing any um, increase in that volume or is that pretty standard for you, what you're seeing right now? A lot in campus recruiting is standard, but it definitely is higher. They've gone up um, for this past year from previous years. Okay, perfect. And Alex, what about you? Yeah, Hi. so I'd like to maybe give a little bit of context maybe of some previous ones, because I think it's always a good guideline to look at it as, okay, if I'm a small size company, there's only gonna be hundreds to thousands of applicants. And usually we like to measure on a monthly basis, what kind of applicant flow you have on that on that front. And then on a midsize, you know, you might get up to that, you know, 10,000 applicants per month. And as you get to the larger tier companies, it's gonna go from anywhere from 10 to 25,000 applicants. I'm working right now at an enterprise level with Fortune 200, 200 company where you're dealing with volumes, and these are really large volumes, anywhere from on the low end, 40,000 applicants per month, all the way up to 75, 80,000 applicants per month. And if you're talking about companies that are doing 20 billion, so really large, large enterprise, you could probably, and we're talking about the top high tech firms in the country, they're gonna be dealing with hundreds of thousands of applicants that are funneling in just based on brand recognition. But right now, uh, one of the challenges that we're working through right now is really putting together a, a very thorough strategy on how do you deal with such a, a surge of 50,000 applicants that are coming in on a monthly basis. Wow, can I say that's that's an incredible volume. It's, it's kind of a number that I wouldn't even 
expect, honestly. I, it's, it's just an absurd, outrageous number of applicants on a monthly basis. And then even the compression back to Jackie's point and David, I think what's so interesting about this is the compression, how quickly the applicants are coming in is also um, incredible within the within hours, you're having hundreds of applicants um, in this moment. It's it's really incredible. Um, so then with that, what strategies and tools do you use to tackle these extremely high applicant volumes? We can kind of start with Alex, you know, we left off with you, you can kind of start us off here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, when you're when you're looking at it, um, you have to look at the whole ecosystem. So typically, uh, you know, brand recognition is going to help you if you're working to a recruiter, working for a solid company. It's got you're going to get organic sort of applicants are going to come in. Um, and then, you know, I think where the technology has really come into play has really been uh, programmatic uh, type of tools that are out there. And so these are some of the at job advertising uh, uh, companies that are out there that can really drive in additional applicants. And so now companies are paying per applicant basis. And so you can get a large percentage of those. So you're going to have that uh, influx of uh, applicants coming, you know, hitting your um, your career site that are going to be organic or paid. And I think it's just really kind of putting together what's your strategy and what's what's reasonable. I mean, you have to kind of crunch the numbers. And so for for me, looking at strategy, you want to you always want to look at the data. So if you're saying, hey, you know, for, you say you get 50,000 applicants and in reality, you know, you're talking about one percent of those applicants are the ones that are going to get hired. Um, so you have to kind of do the math and crawl, you know, crunch it and see how many requisitions you have opened. So there's a, there's a lot of sort of data that you got to have to sift through before you can kind of put a sound strategy together. Wow. OK, fantastic. What about you, David? Um, some of the tools that we use is um, like your your branding strategies. So marketing yourself in a way that is representative of your culture and so forth, where you're attracting those that align with that and that you're, you know, deterring, deterring those that don't um, in your applic in your job descriptions and making sure that they're very clear, easy to read. So people can know whether or not they're qualified for the roles will help you in making sure you get the right types of applicants. Um, also using pre-screening questions uh, where Candidates are answering questions as part of the application process. And then, of course, leveraging um, various AI tools and analytics tools to help you to help the recruiter um, go through the, the profiles and be able to identify those that match the, the requisition they have. And, you know, that can be a task in itself. So some organizations I've worked for uh, sourcing helps go through the applicants that are in the inbox. Um, others, it's you know, there's like a scoring, a grading system that's built into it where when someone applies to, let's say, position A, they'll get, a, you know, a higher match score. And as long as they meet the minimum or basic qualifications and have some, if not all, of the preferred qualifications, those are going to get the highest score. And those will be the ones that are contacted first. Perfect, perfect. So we're using tools to help us filter through the applicants. So very good. Um, what about you, Jackie? Yeah, I would second that. I think I really appreciate questions in an application and as much as we can know about the candidate um, at the front end to help us be narrowing and getting down to the people that could be the best possible applicants as quickly as possible. Um, so looking, being able to filter to see who's met us at an event. Um, let's make sure we're in touch with you as fast as possible. You put in that effort to come and meet us live. Um, looking as well, automated assessments that help us a lot. So that's our first stage of the interview process for our for our campus roles. And so we do our best to keep that a very um, personalized experience as well, because that is important to candidate experience. Um, but having assessments that sort of help on the front end to say, for both sides, like, is this potentially a good match, um, focusing because a majority of our roles are software engineering. So we can kind of say, hey, do we have some baseline technical skills that are beating, being met? And then if so, let's keep investing time in getting to know each other. We have an interesting question that's come in from the chat. Um, Katrina oh. asks, 
do you ever set a threshold or a quota on applicant amount? Uh, for example, we will close this rack after this certain number of applicants has been reached. I, I think it varies, right? It, it varies on the level of position. I think there's always intentions if if it's a, a position that's highly fillable in a short period of time, a recruiter will want to go ahead and close it off as quickly as possible to avoid having 500 or thousands of applicants that might appear. That would probably be the only time that you would close it off if it's a high volume response. But otherwise, you, you know, recruiters typically you want to go ahead and continue pouring into the database. Mm -hmm. What about uh, David or Jackie, anything different here? Or are you doing that as well? Typically, in my experience, most of the time the positions are open until they're filled. Um, but like Alex said, there is times where you may pause the posting. Um, and, and so that way you can go through all the applicants that have applied thus far. That way you just don't have a continuous flow of applicants. Mm. Yeah, I really want to spend some time on this question because I think this is where the pain is, right? So it's it's a high amount of applicants in a compression kind of situation where it's in a short period of time. So I want to make sure that I circle back to what you've surfaced here. So we're using tools to filter. Um, perhaps are we adding more questions on the front end? So as we're doing the screening or as we're in the talent gateway is what I call it. Are there more questions there to help you understand um, the talent up front earlier? Let's really delve into some of the solutions here to, to make sure that we're getting to narrow those candidates down in the way that we used to. So high applicant volumes, they've increased, but the work is still the work. We still have to be able to narrow down that candidate pool to your finalists. And so we're using tools. What are some of the other su suggestions that you have for folks to get to that, that, you know, solid list of finalists that move on and advance in the process? I, I think the screening questions up front are probably one of the best uh, data points that you can capture. So that way you can really identify and narrow down the, the folks of candidates that actually truly are the best fits, best alignment for the positions. And then secondly, um, a lot of times there's like referrals or employee referrals. Um, those are some of the ways I've seen it where like if somebody, if somebody from internally refers this person, then usually the hiring managers are more prone to you know, want to speak with them. And usually that person will know, especially if it's someone from the same team, they'll know that this person's qualified based upon their experience with them. Okay, very good. Are we seeing an increase of uh, referrals in this environment? So my understanding is we have high applicant volumes. I would assume that there's an increase with referrals, but I want to ask all of you, are we seeing that? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it, I think it varies. You know, what is the industry standard? I think it's thirty percent. I can't remember what Sherm is. Uh, it, where it kind of so I think that's always a great benchmark for companies. Some of the really reputable companies are going to be going towards fifty percent, um, but I think anywhere between like twenty thirty percent is usually a good benchmark. Where you're saying a quarter of your hires are going to come from uh, employee referrals. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. And I would definitely, yeah, I would say we've had some increase in the volume of our referrals for sure. And I think that that is an interesting piece of talking about volume because you think about it a lot from a candidate experience perspective. But then when you get into the referral space, you're also looking at that employee experience for these people who are invested in your hiring, our employees themselves. Um, so it's also balancing how are we giving the best possible candidate experience and how are we giving the best possible referral experience at high volume that is personalized and also isn't, at, you know, for my group, becoming the point where their entire day is just taking referral calls. Um, so, so it is an interesting thing to balance with high scale as well. Yeah, for sure. That high touch, <laughs> that high touch is hard when it's uh, high volumes. Um, Let's move into, I wanted to get a better sense of the candidate pools now, right? So again, just I'm very inquisitive. I want to know and drill into this. Are you receiving a greater number of unqualified applicants or is it just a high volume of qualified applicants? Let's start with David. I'm really curious about this. There are 
an increase. There is an increase in the number of unqualified applicants, and but by unqualified, I mean they don't meet the minimum or basic qualifications for the position. So that's why I think it's very important that those are clearly stated in the job postings and job descriptions. So that way people are not applying, uh, assuming they're reading the job descriptions. But a lot of people, you know, they'll read a job description and if they have, you know, 60 or 70 percent or 80 percent of the listed skills, they'll apply. So if you don't break it up and make it, you know, these are this is what's required and this is what's preferred, then I think you could also be adding to that number of disqualified applicants by doing so or by not doing so. Perfect. What about you, Jackie? Um, I would say it's it's a little bit of both. We've just had higher volume everywhere. I will say for for our roles, we are still doing sourcing. So it's not to the level where we're getting fully the, the number of qualified applicants we need for every position to not do sourcing. That is still a part of how we build our classes and find the best possible candidates. But we have seen higher volume of qualified and unqualified. Mm, interesting. I mean, it's an interesting question, right? So it's, it's, it's just a high volume of everything. So I would again assume that you would see, seem you would receive a higher volume of unqualified applicants. I mean, um, folks are under pressure. So I would just assume, but it's it's great to hear from you all directly what you're experiencing in this area. Even from a campus perspective, I think that's a little bit different. I would I would assume it would be a little bit less in that area. But again, it's interesting to hear that you are receiving both un, an increase of unqualified applicants as well as an increase of qualified applicants. What about you, Alex? Yeah, so I think what's interesting about that use case is uh, you, know, you want to kind of put a strategy in place because most of the time, if only 1% of applicants are going to get hired, uh, typically what happens is the rest of uh, applicants get dispositioned. And so in a more mature sort of strategy business model, a, a company will look at their applicants and redistribute or repurpose them and maybe uh, job match them for other positions. Because you know you may have a hundred or a thousand applicants and just because that one applicant wasn't a good fit for your requisition and you, you have, again, hundreds of requisitions, I have clients that have thousands of requisitions. So you could have a software engineer who could be a possible match for you know five or six different positions. That's kind of where the strategy piece comes into place and seeing how can you be effective in redistributing, repurposing or reallocating your talent that you have and doing a better job as far as job matching for some of the other skill sets, other positions. And that's where effective pipelining you know, really comes into play. So I, I think it's not you know the quality. I, I forget what it is. It, it, it's somewhere between two to three percent as a measurement as far as quality goes as far as um, applicants for a requisition. So, and that, that's changed, that's varied, right? Some might be a little bit higher than that, but it's a small percentage number. And so, um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to, to, to go back on, you know, as far as the sort of the, the efforts, as far as making sure that you have a applicant experience um, that's favorable and optimal. You know, when you re when these applicants apply, they're they're applying to multiple positions because they're probably not going to hear from recruiters. So that's why it's a numbers game most of the time. And, and so we have our methods baked in that we're we're doing the auto reply, maybe you know the phone calls, the uh, um, the maybe reaching out to them on social media. <clears throat> um, texting has been a big uh, tool that's been used um, even uh, even before they become applicants. Um, we've actually set up um, chat enabled um, plugins on these jobs where now a visitor can engage, get a little bit more, maybe even talk to a recruiter that's live, almost like a concierge type of service. And then that prompts them to go ahead and apply for a position. And that's been a really valuable tool that you can convert a visitor into an applicant just by having a tool uh, of that standard. Um, also, bot chatbot deployments, uh, texting, those are really big. So we have, um, depending on a CRM that you're working with, uh, to be able to deploy texting bots that can now go out into the masses and can gather information and engage with applicants is another enhanced applicant experience. And then I think one of the more exciting ones that's really out there now, and this is, you know, this is going to become mainstream because we're seeing it in other verticals and sectors is conversational 
AI voice digital assistants. Uh, you know, the, the voice AI is here. It's already happening in other verticals in the marketplace. Um, real estate, sales, lead generation, that business model it can easily pivot over to talent acquisition. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of a flood in the marketplace right now where companies are trying to figure out how can we best tailor a solution to, to deal with this large quantity of applicants and digital voice assistance is, you know, it's, it's, it's a human touch now. It's not as the inflection of the voice isn't as high, doesn't get choppy. And you can ask the screening questions. It's generative AI. The data is tied in to your CRM, whether through an API or data transfer. And so the companies that are really invested in AI right now are going to be the ones that say, OK, how do I scale to reach out to thousands of applicants and requalify them? Because if they might, they're, if they're disposition, no longer qualified for position, let me requalify them so that we can get gather additional data from them, put it in a CRM and then engage with them again for another job opportunity. And that's really where the high transactional volume technology when it comes to AI is going to become an important factor in de to dealing with this, this issue, this challenge that a lot of companies are going through right now. Wow. Well, you said a couple of things that I want to make sure I call out. So repurposing and pipelining, those are two things that I find are difficult to do when it's high candidate volumes, right? So to me, it seems that the CRMs and the ATS technology really is critical in this environment. You really have to have solid tools to help you with those things. Otherwise, it's it's really challenging in a high volume environment to repurpose candidates and, and to pipeline. Um, I would say, you know, David and Jackie, are you finding that to be a challenge for you? So you have, you know, fantastic talent. They just aren't a match for the role that you're working on. Having the time and space and maybe the tools to be able to repurpose them, do you have effective tools that are helping you with this? In the past, uh, in past employers, uh, yes, uh, where I currently work is not large enough to have that volume of applicants where we can't get through them. But um, some things that you can do if you work for a smaller, medium, or even a large company and don't have tools is if the Use pre-screening questions, as I said previously. Um, if you have access to a CRM, that's a great place to put profiles into that you know could be a match. A lot of times people, as Alex said, apply to multiple positions, not knowing where they're gonna get uh, you know, interviewed for. Um, so if you think of background, someone's background aligns to a particular team, try sharing that with the hiring managers or the recruiters that focus in that space to see if they can identify potential matches. Um, if you have sourcing teams, this is a great place to put sourcers uh, through so you can identify and pull the, the, you know, the candidates, the highest potential candidates that you can potentially place elsewhere. Fantastic. Yeah. And what about I, you, Jackie? Yeah, I would say um, one thing that is, that is enabling, I guess, for the campus environment with this is that previous intern applicants can end up being full-time applicants. And so it's easy to just narrow down, maybe not that entire pool because it can be quite large, but narrow down who are the people we engaged with previously. Let's look at that. They, in some way, we liked something about them. We met them at an event. They came through the interview process, what have you. We can narrow down to that pool for previous roles, knowing that the next year they could be an applicant for the full-time role. Um, so that's something that's helpful for us. I think a, a piece of that is just filtering for the applicants and a piece is also reminders are really helpful in the ATS. I know I've always done that as a recruiter of setting a reminder like 12 months later to be like, talk to this person again, search your email, start the thread again. Um, so I think those things are helpful. The other thing I just thought of that I would add to it is making sure that your ATS or and CRM um, ideally in, are integrated so they can speak to each other. So you can easily move candidates between different roles and pipelines. And also that you have technology or uh, an ATS CRM that you can actually perform searches on because you when you're sourcing a company's, you know, ATS and CRM are probably some of the most valuable places you should start. And 
if you if they initially were interested in your company, let's say during you know early talent or early career stage, and they have five years of experience now, and you're looking to fill a mid level position, which is typically probably one of the hardest roles to fill in my experience, just because. If they're out of college, you can find them out of college. And if they're experienced, you can find them. But right in between, that's always the hardest. So you can leverage, you know, past early talent roles, as an example, uh, when you, if you can search through your system to be able to identify that those talent. And if they've taken the time to apply to your company, they've at least, they know about your brand, they've invested it, they've researched it, they're interested in, com in the company. And I think it's always important uh, in talent acquisition to remember that your, your candidates uh, or prospects are also clients and potential customers um, of who you work for. So it's very important to, again, I think ha make sure that everybody is, again, being able to search through it and has a positive candidate experience and get some sort of response to their application. Even if it's, you know, on the end, you fill the position. I I'm sure you've we've all seen the visit, the resume or the emails sent out that are, you know, that have been shared that candidates have received that said, Hey, thanks for your interest. But we received 5,000 applicants and, you know, we had to selected some other folks as an example. Or at least yes. the candidates. Okay. For sure. Yeah. And you know, one thing I could add to this, I think it's a, this is a big takeaway. If you can do this. And again, this is, this is comes down to like a strategy piece and it's really about the data. So, you know, if you're, if you wouldn't really want to go ahead and dissect, you know, your your talent community, you want to do effective pipelining, uh, you go to the data and you look at your your numbers and you look and say, all right, where did my hires come from last year? And you're going to be able through that identify core skill sets. And they're usually about a half a dozen, maybe 10 core skill set areas that are going to be your 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 hires. And so at that point, um, if you're able to start building talent communities and say, all right, I know I need software engineers or I know I need retail people or I know I need call center people, whatever vertical, whatever sector you're in, you start segmenting that. And that's what David had mentioned. You go back to your CRM. And this is what we talk about pipelining. Pipelining is essentially creating folders within your CRM that says I'm making a commitment here to go ahead and really start funneling and building my pipeline with software engineers that meet the profile of the types of hires that we typically do. And so you can really benchmark that. You can look at that and say, okay, I have, I started the year off with 500 in my pipeline and I'm adding to it. By the end of the year, I might be at 5,000 or 2,000. But essentially what you're doing is you're creating a talent community. Once you have a talent community, that, that's where the next strategy piece comes into play. How will you engage? How will you communicate with that talent community? And so this is where effective e-marketing campaigns, starting to put storyboards together and allow with, you know, chat GPT, you can put all kinds of themes. And, you, and if you have a robust CRM, most, most CRMs are going to have so those, those marketing templates or campaigns that you're able to reach out to. Um, and then you can tie in. I know a lot of times we tie in um, online chat events, you can promote events. And so all of a sudden you're saying, hey, we're having a software online chat event. Please come to our event. Now we're we're targeting that talent community. And I think that's that's really kind of getting into more of a strategy phase of saying, let's let's really focus on our pipeline. Let's build it and let's keep nurturing it and engaging with it. And so when that applicant or when that 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 talent does become available, they're going to think of you because you've been peppering them throughout the whole year with information, content that's, you know, that's impactful, that's meaningful, that's resonating, that's branding, it's marketing, those types of things. Very good. I want to quickly get a sense of what type of roles all of you are supporting. Uh, for Alex, that would be your clients, but really quickly just kind of getting a snapshot of what types of roles you're supporting. You can start. We can start with Jackie. Yeah, so I mentioned some, but intern and early career hiring for our engineering department. So mostly software engineering, but some product management, security, product design as well. Our, our, off, our main um, regions are the U.S. and EMEA, um, New York and Paris being the two major locations we're hiring for. Awesome. David? Um, for myself, I'm just going to speak back for the last 
we'll say 12 years. Uh, it's been mostly on um, engineering and product focused positions. So uh, product managers, um, software engineers, um, data engineers, data uh, analytics, data scientists, um, cloud engineers, cloud engineering type roles, as well as inform information security focused positions. Okay, and just now quickly, uh, what's what has it been like right now that you're sourcing on? What's kind of hot for you right now? Right now, I'm focusing on information security because that's the okay. focus of my current employer. But previously, it was a lot of engineering and cloud engineering. Okay, perfect, perfect. Alex, what about your clients? Yeah, yes. kind of a mix of what, what, what they said, but I think it would be you know uh, software engineers, uh, cybersecurity, anything in the program or project management space. Um, I, anything in, uh, in data science, so and it falls under the AI umbrella, machine learning, AI, that's, that's a really hot area right now, as far as for high tech uh, type of firms. Um, but, but there's also, you know, others in the past that I've supported that, you know, even on the financial side or wealth management or, you know, th those aspects of it too, because that's, there's even some technical pieces that fall into that as well. But Pretty, you know, pretty. When it comes to technology, I think it's you know across the board. It's it's all the, the highly sought after skill sets that everybody's going after, that everybody's wrestling for. Um, that's that's the challenge right now as far as the supply goes. Okay, yeah, it's good for us to you know listeners to know what the landscape is, what type of roles we're supporting. Um, from there, was someone else coming in? We've got a couple of good questions in the chat. I just want to make sure that um, we catch those too. Oh, okay, perfect. I'm not seeing them, so I. Does anyone else see the, the questions in here? <laughs> um, yeah, we've got one from Joe. Uh, how do you sift through the non-viewed applicants after filling a rec with high volumes besides the, the mass rejection process that, that a lot of folks do? Who wants to take that one? So, yeah, go, ahead, go, ahead, Alex. go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I think it just goes back to what I just mentioned is, you know, you have your applicants, they're tied into the ATS, and David mentioned this, but you, you want to redistribute them back over to your CRM, which is a prospecting sourcing tool. And I, you got to really get organized in your, your CRM. And I think that's probably one of the more underutilized uh, tools that are out there. And a lot of firms, the small to mid-sized companies don't make the investments in a CRM. They're, they're actually only, you know, an ATS has a lot of limitations as far as your ability to organize and manage your pipelines and things like that. So if you don't have a CRM, you, you, you know, it's going to be kind of a little old school there as far as how you're, how you're, you're segmenting and reaching out to your, to your applicants. But yeah, you want to repurpose them back into your CRM, I think ultimately to, to go ahead and, and start a new engagement and nurture them in a talent community sort of basis. And then we've got, thank you so much. And we've got one more question. Speaking of AI, what are, your thoughts about the battle of the AIs, that is applicants using AI to try and outsmart the employers filtering AI. Mm. So I re recall reading a, a post from a recruiter that had a post posted a job, brand new position, and within a few days had, let's say 300 applicants. And as they were going through the resumes, there was, I think it was 68 applicants had the same exact resume. So oh, wow. I think that if you're gonna use AI, whether you're a job seeker or a recruiter, you should do so in a fashion that it doesn't have the final say, but it, it helps you in the decision-making pro making process. Um, because if you're using the same resume or the cookie cutter resume that's spit out by ChatGPT, um, it's not gonna, it's not going to be 100% accurate and it's, it's likely going to be pulling from past people's, uh, you know, writing. Mm -hmm. And also understand it's not going to go unnoticed, right? I think that's something that we need to call out is that, you know, AI needs to come with the due diligence of doing that work yourself. It can't do everything. So just know that on the other side, a recruiter will be able to notice there's ways for us to, to fact check these things as well. Um, Perfect. With that, let's delve into skills verification and candidate experience in this environment. Very important. Um, so high applicant volumes could potentially make it difficult to detect cheating. So kind of what we're talking about here a little bit. How do we verify skills in an environment like this? Let's start off with, let's go with David. Let's start with you again. 
So skills assessments for technical positions. Um, I've you, some of the companies I've worked for have used a variety of different tools um, as part of the initial screening process. The ones that I like is Carrots, um, CoderPad, and uh, HackerRank. Um, they're all different in different ways. So if you're gonna, if you're looking for a tool or trying to figure out what's best for you, talk to them all and see what they, what's your needs are, and go with the one that best fits that. But using them or partnering with tools like that will help your engineering teams know whether or not someone has a talent. And you can have them design in advance of what they look for and have folks uh, or have the assessments basically score and gauge their, their knowledge in that space of whatever is required. Perfect. Um, Jackie? Yeah, uh, I would say this is a tough one. We'll, we'll keep reinventing the ways that we assess cheating and and these types of things because they keep reinventing the ways that they're doing it as, as candidates. <laughs> um, but I, I think the parts that feel the most important to me are having human decision makers in the interview process and then having multiple types of assessment. So if there's something that may be flagging in one area where someone's like, I can't quite tell, but it seemed like they might have seen the questions before or something like that, you have other assessments to then be balancing that out to make the best possible decision holistically to say, okay, what do we think happened in this situation? Ultimately, what are the skills this person has and what, who is the person that would be showing up to be in this role? And is this someone that we can make a good call would be a good person for the team? Very good. How about you, Alex? Anything to add here? No, I don't think so. I think just uh, other than the, you know, the video screening assessments, they, they, they've been out for a while now. And, and, you know, I've seen, I had a recruiter friend, colleague uh, tell me that they, uh, they piloted a, a video assessment and they had to, they had about 700 interns. And so it's a lot, lot, big volume, but through the video screening, they were able to get it down from 700 to less than a hundred. And through those further assessments, we're able to essentially get them down to about 25. And they ended up, you know, wanting to hire about a, a dozen or so interns, but it wasn't until the very end of that tail end of that process where they were working with a manageable 20, 25, um, uh, you know, applicants or candidates that they actually engage and actually spoke to them. So these tools are highly valuable to be able to do that. And so I highly recommend a lot of companies, you know, have some limitations on video screening and things of that nature. But if you're able to do that and you have high volume, high touch type of um, experiences, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they, they work really well. So. Awesome. I um, want, want all of you to share some ways that we can provide a good candidate experience when we're verifying skills. So in the same realm of verifying skills, how are we also providing a great candidate experience in that in that space? Let's start with you, Jackie. Sure. I think um, that I think this is sort of a, a privilege of especially an intern role is that you have a little bit more flexibility there because both sides are agreeing to a temporary position. And so we have a little bit of leeway where with a full-time role, you might be a little bit more risk adverse. We can say, okay, you know what? Both of us are looking at this for a set amount of time. We hope we got this right. We hope both of us like each other, but we can take a little bit more chances there. Um, so I think that with that, we can be a little bit more generous in how we're pushing on that skill verification to be looking more for how someone works and how they would be as a teammate and how coachable they are and those sort of those things that are most important at the intern level mm -hmm. when someone does not have a lot of breadth and depth to their experience that you can look to more obviously. Um, so I think we we have a, a little bit more generosity at that level. I think one thing that I would say is it's it's a hard it's definitely a hard um, situation to sort of balance because everyone hopes that every single hire is perfect. 
Um, but at the end of the day, and every candidate in an interview process is like, I want to get this job. I want to win. It feels there's like motivation in yourself to be like, let me do this. Let me achieve this. But then today you're both trying to figure out, would you actually be good at this role? And would you be the best person for this role? And so it can be hard, but the best case scenario is that if, you know, it's a no in that process for both sides in the long run, that's good for both of you because it wasn't right. Um, but it's hard for sure. Yeah. What about you, David? Um, I think it's also, it's very important to always remember that we're the human elements. Um, the whole process of applying and looking for a job can be very stressful, whether you're beginning your career or you're experienced professional and rejection is not an easy pill to swallow. So I think you want to be human about it and be professional and, mm -hmm. Um, as Jackie said, make sure that, you know, that there's a good match and you want to make sure that your processes align with that. But also, you know, in the event that someone doesn't work out for position A, there's always position B. And don't close the door per se, but look at where, if there is anywhere else, like if somebody is really interested and you've taken the time to speak with them and they're interested in your company, but position A doesn't work out, see if there's other places and other recruiting teams or peers or partners of yours that they could potentially be a fit for. And then if there isn't anything currently, then um, invite them into a talent community as Alex was talking about, because those are great places that you can nurture and develop and stay, uh, they can stay connected to your company uh, if you leverage those technologies and strategies efficiently. Um, but I always think you should, you know, you should always, again, like I said, be human, but if you say you're gonna do something, make sure you do it. And I know it's not, always easy when you have thousands or hundreds of people that you're trying to do things for, but, um, you know, set yourself up. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Um, and always try to close the loop with everybody. There's no reason why people, if they aren't moving forward, shouldn't be able to get a message indicating to them that they're not moving forward. Um, the, the general rule that I try to use is if I talk to someone, I try to close the loop with them on the phone or verbally. Uh, versus sending them the you know the email, but if I haven't spoken with someone or they haven't interviewed for that particular role, um, I try to you know I'll make sure that they get the the emails that the disposition emails I guess I should say. Yes, as I ask as I ask you the question, Alex, um, what I want to delve more into here. So in as it relates to verifying skills. So for example, we've talked about assessments, for example, right? So these are pretty. Um, it can be an intense process for a candidate, right? So you're asking one, someone to take a math test or to go through a simulation of some sort. So you're asking um, quite a bit you know, of a candidate. How are we being more communicative, for example? That's some of the ways at which we can provide a great candidate experience. How are we or have we provided accommodations for candidates as it relates to these testing and assessments that we're that we're um, rolling out for verification purposes. Um, have any of you had to do that? We can start with Alex, but wanted to learn a little bit more about those things as it relates to candidate experience and verifying skills. Have you had to do those things, Alex? Yeah, and, and there's always a challenge behind that because um, if you're a candidate who's highly sought after, you know, and you have this extra step in the process now where you have to take time and do a screening assessment or a test and it's going to take additional time. Uh, we've seen it. We've seen, you know, the, 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 the applicants, the candidates ghost the tests, the exams, the screening, and they don't, they, they opt. So they start ranking and stacking as well. So if you're going to go ahead and implement something, uh, something like that, it's really uh, coaching them through that or making it as minimal of a burden as possible. Um, but if you're in a position of a company where you can do that, you can add that layer of screening and it's it's a hard requirement. Absolutely. Go ahead and do it. But if you know, you always want to look at the balance, if it's something that a recruiter we've all gone through this where managers give us the two or three screening questions to ask, you know, during, during a recruiter screen call, we can do it that way to minimize it. But um, but ultimately, you know, we always want to put the onus on hiring managers to kind of make that call. Um, but there are some tools that are being utilized. There's a lot of companies that do embrace those tools that says, hey, go ahead and go through our technical assessments and, uh, and validate you know, your experiences. And I think for some of the more technical positions, absolutely 
uh, think it's great. But then there's also the non-technical ones too, where they come in handy. So it's really just trying to understand where's your position in the marketplace and can you afford to, you know, scare off a potential candidate from, you know what, it's not worth my time. It already takes them just to, to apply for a position. It can range anywhere from eight minutes to 16, 17 minutes for an application process, depending on how complex it is. So it's a lot of time uh, consumption there for, for applicants. You want to make the best use of their time for that to optimize the, the applicant experience overall. I love that. It's it's really that right there, the balance of it, right? So you have to do the, the verification piece, right? So we have to do the assessments, but how do we balance not scaring off the applicants, right? So you've already completed an application, you've already done a Sandra or some type of video interview, you have, you know, several rounds uh, of interviews during a process, and then you're also asking them to take an assessment that might take 20 to 40 minutes and something that's thought provoking like math or doing a simulation, you're asking a lot of these candidates, how can we still provide a great experience knowing that they're they're subject to all of these things is, is really the key here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see, what else do we want to do here? Let's just talk about in general, as we kind of start to wrap up here, how are we setting our candidates up for success? Um, what are some best practices there just in general? Want to hear from each of you on this before we kind of close things out and before Joshua comes back. Uh, Jackie? Yes, we love a prep guide in our world. Um, so our goal tends to be how can we cut out as much of the signal that would just be confusing to really get down to the skills of that person. And so what I mean by that is how can we calm nerves as much as possible? How can we answer simple questions? So we're really narrowing that down. So we have prep guides at different stages of the process to give them understanding of, you know, earlier on, this is the process itself, face-to-face, um, -face, you know, getting deeper into those questions at every stage also for some of them offering example questions that they can do on their own if they want. And then as we also move along, more information as well about the company itself, because the closer you get to the end, the closer they are getting to potentially making a decision about if they would join you. Um, I think that another thing for setting them up for success that I think the recruiters do really well is just trying to build that relationship of getting to know them as a person and being their advocate, that I think goes a very long way in that process. And it's really important to me that candidates can be transparent and do really have that strong feeling of this person is looking out for you. They might give you some feedback that they want to make sure you know before you go to your next interview, or they will be looking out for, for what you need in this process. Um, and I think that that's a really, really important thing in that success component. So that's prep calls along the way potentially from them or, hey, you mentioned this thing. Let me make sure I give you this information or connect you with this person. Um, I think those things are important in that process. Yes. What about, uh, what about you, David? Um, kind of to build upon what Jackie was saying, um, I think it's very important to clearly articulate the, the company, um, the team that you're on, the work that the person's going to be doing, and making sure that they have their basic questions answered before they go into the interviewing process, to make sure that they're still interested and the role's the right fit for them. Um, but assuming it is, um, it, walking them through what the entire interviewing process looks like and setting up um, or providing them with preparation information and guidelines, not giving them the answers to the question, but if somebody's going to take an assessment, you want them to, you don't want to blindside them. You want them to be as prepared as possible so you could truly assess them for their skill sets, right? Um, so by having guides and uh, like prep material put together or that you can email to them in a separate email after your call is great. Um, and then having touch bases with them, you know, letting them know, hey, you know, you're, I know you're speaking with so and so today. You know, just wanted to see if you had any questions, you know, like the day before or whatnot. And I think it's also very important to, you know, explain the, the entire process to them. So that way they know as they're moving through the stages, you're managing their expectations and the fear and you're, you're building rapport and 
understanding what they're experiencing. Um, so you can collect different data points that you might need to make some adjustments along the way. Because as Alex has said multiple times, the term balance, I think, is extremely important because it's it's balancing um, a process with capturing the data, essential data to make the, the best decisions, but not overburdening the applicant by, you know, having them run the gauntlet, uh, you know, and have having unnecessary, overly complex, long drawn out interviewing processes and screening panel or screening panels or whatever they do. Um, in my personal opinion, I think it's best to have, you know, probably no more than three interviewing stages just because of what candidates go through um, when you have long drawn out processes. And don't think that top candidates are, are only interviewing with your company, right? They're interviewing you just as much as you're interviewing them. So if we have a streamlined process that allows them to make their decisions within their time frame, you're more likely going to be able to close more of those candidates uh, and have them join your, your company uh, versus the alternative. Awesome. Anything to add here, Alex? No, I think yeah, Jackie and David I nailed it, right? It's it's almost like you have to get back to the basics, right? Get back to the basics yeah. and really assess what is that recruiting journey like, that candidate experience journey. And I think a lot of companies fall short of that. How often are you reviewing that journey and where can you tweak or enhance that experience, you know, for that candidate? I think we all have to just get accustomed. A year goes by so fast and next you know you're you're dealing with a model that's two, three years old and you haven't really repositioned the opportunity. So that's great. Yeah, I think the one thing I wanna add here, uh, I'm gonna answer my own question, uh, <laughs> is I think that we have to, humanity, I'm gonna use the word humanity, we have to understand that it's hard to be a candidate. So regardless of the volumes that we are facing, and that's hard and that's tough and that's stressful, but always know that it is hard to be a candidate and try to make sure that we're human in these processes. And that will allow you to understand what's, what's right in a process. So what is it that you would want to receive? That is communication. What is next? What can I expect next? Someone shouldn't have to wonder like, you know, what's happening next? Where am I? What's going on? Uh, the less questions they have to ask you, you've done your job. They know what's happening. What is the process? What is this? What is the interview process? What type of interview is it going to be? Right? What what's the format of the interview? Providing information goes a long way to people. Doing what you can to make sure that people are comfortable in an interview process goes a long way. So I think you know humanity is something I wanted to surface. And one other thing I wanted to surface was in terms of advocacy for candidates, I think that there's a way for us to be advocates for candidates and also be a consultant to the business, which is also what we wanna do. We don't wanna be order takers. So to be able to, to successfully do that, when it comes to assessments and things of that nature, sometimes we have to push back on the business if an assessment is not appropriate, for example. If we are uh, rolling out an assessment for math and the position doesn't require math, we can be a consultant to the business to say that, hey, this is not appropriate for the type of roles that we are hiring for. For. We can be a consultant. And you're also a, a, an advocate for the candidate because you're subjecting someone to something that's not appropriate, right? It's very hard to take a math test, right? We know that, hey, this person's going to be spending 40 minutes on something that's not necessary. So again, just wanted to call those things out. I think those are important advocacy and humanity on uh, being a consultant to the business. Great. Yeah, Joshua's coming back. <laughs> hello, hello. What a great session. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules to put this together. Well, Saj, awesome moderation as usual. So thank you so much for putting this together. And a uh, big thank you to our friends over at CoderPad for making today's presentation possible. David, Jackie, Alex, I would welcome you back anytime. Hopefully we can work on some future content together in the near future. To everybody tuning in, thank you so much for your continued support of this program. And if you're ready to get on stage or to get on a webinar, please reach out because we're always looking for fresh perspectives to add to our programming. If you're not ready to be on a panel or be a speaker, but you've got some topics that you think would be great to include in our programming, feel free to reach out because we wanna make sure that we're bringing you the content that you need to have in order to raise the bar within your organizations. And without any further ado, we're going to draw this to a close. Everybody have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Bye.